We are going to return to uh, to Romans 15, and uh, we read there the first 13 verses of the chapter, and uh, we're going to look this evening at uh, verse 7 especially, uh, so that just uh, is quite a simple, clear, straightforward uh, verse, so Romans 15 verse 7 says, accept one another then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise uh, to God. So uh, there's a very clear instruction to the church in Rome about how they live together. And uh, as they live together, there has to be a really clear acceptance of each other, uh, just as Christ has accepted them. And the motive and all of that, of course, is the glory of God. Um, I've been at the beach several times this summer. I uh, can't make up my mind what kind of relationship I have with beaches. Uh, so uh, it's a sort of love-hate relationship. Beaches are beautiful and wonderful, and yet sand is irritating and annoying, uh, especially when you get back to the car and uh, it, the sand kind of disgorges itself for the next few months. But I've uh, been at the beach several times. I know lots of you have been at the beach over the summer. And... Uh, Take your shoes off, roll up your trousers, and uh, walk along the shore in the water, paddle away, enjoy the splashing, and uh, make footprints in the sand. And uh, it's really easy, of course, to make an impression in the sand as you walk along, as we walk. Uh, even if you're quite light, you tend to see your footprints left behind. And so, on the beach, our weight leaves an imprint. And then, of course, the tide will come in later on, and wash away our footsteps. Uh, our presence there will uh, be forgotten very soon. Uh, one of the key themes in this passage is uh, glory. And uh, when we speak about God's glory, we are talking about something that is uh, weighty. We're talking about God's majesty. We're talking about God's authority. Uh, we're talking about God's power, we're talking about God's influence, we're talking about God's holiness, His goodness, His purity, His truth. And all of those uh, aspects of God's character come to us with power and with force and weight. And uh, that, that, that notion of weight is always there uh, behind the, Bi the Bible uh, teaching on glory. And that means that when you meet with God in His glory, the weight of that meeting, the weight of that encounter, will leave an impression on your life. It's going to leave a mark. And it leaves an indelible mark, an impression that doesn't go, that can't be washed away. Meeting with the living God Meeting with God in His glory is such an incredible experience, a profound experience, that it cannot leave you unchanged. Now, we see that in Scripture. We see, for instance, uh, Moses in the burning bush, or Jacob at Bethel with the ladder ascending into heaven. Or we see it uh, with the disciples and Peter in the boat, or Isaiah in the temple. Every time somebody in the Bible encounters God in His glory, it's an absolutely devastating experience that leaves its mark on them forever. And the Christian faith is, is a faith that brings us into that kind of encounter with God. Not a trivial encounter, not a shallow encounter, not a, a, a kind of fleeting encounter, but rather uh, when we really do meet with God in His power, His holiness, and His majesty, it leaves its mark on us. So, in verse 6, Paul writes about how we glorify God by our unity. We give weight to God. We ascribe significance to God by His power. And then, in verse 7, he says that Jesus accepts us. Why? in order to bring praise or glory to God, so that God's weight and majesty 
would be seen and known. And then in verse 9, he talked about how the promises of salvation made to the patriarchs about the salvation of the Gentiles or non-Jewish peoples have been fulfilled so that God would be glorified for his great mercy. So, God is a God of glory who leaves his mark in our lives. And in our worship, we want to make our mark. We want to sort of uh, give weight to God and say, yes, our God is great. And our God weighs upon us mightily. In verse 7, that the weight of God in our lives is seen in this idea of acceptance. Uh, Jesus' acceptance of us brings glory to God. That's the fundamental theological truth in here. So, that's the doctrine you want to grasp. Jesus has accepted me. Jesus has accepted you. Why? Because in that great act of mercy, He brings honor and glory to His Father in heaven, and that's the great desire, the great passion, the great longing of His life, to make much of His Father in heaven, to give great prominence and praise to his Father in heaven. And Jesus does that by the way that he reaches out to people like me and you with mercy. He sees our need and he has compassion. With forgiveness, he sees our guilt and he's ready to take our guilt away. With love, he sees our loneliness and he comes to embrace us in the gospel with grace. He knows we don't deserve any of His goodness, but He pays the cost. He goes to the cross. He suffers for us. And He does that so that we can be accepted. And Paul says, think about what it meant for God to accept you and for Christ to accept you. And in the same way, you need to accept others even when it's costly, even when it's hard, and you need to accept them with just as much grace and love as God has shown when He accepts us. This is, as I said already, about a community that's struggling to live with itself, Uh, a community where some people are more welcome in the church than others. And uh, Paul is saying we need to get past that and to become a much more inclusive community where acceptance of others is central to the way that we think, act, and behave. And I want to apply that into St. Columbus and to ask how we accept others and how we uh, act towards others and react towards others in the church who are different from us or who are difficult for us. And I especially want us to think about how we act towards the outsider because uh, summer's coming to its uh, close and a nice blaze of sunshine for the last week or two. Uh, Schools are back. Unis are coming back uh, in the term time soon. There will be people moving to the city. Uh, There will be students returning. There will be new people in church. There will be people thinking, will this be the church that I want to become a part of? And uh, sometimes we think about bringing friends to church, and we want people to come to our church who've never been to church before. And all of these people, we've got to ask ourselves, if they come, what kind of welcome are they going to get? in this church? What is our attitude towards the newcomer, the outsider, the visitor? What kind of heart do we have for those people, and how do we express that in the way that we behave? And so, acceptance is a great idea in the Bible. The word that Paul uses here for acceptance is used several times in the Old Testament. Uh, Sorry, New Testament. Okay, let's go Greek, not Hebrew. So, uh, in the New Testament, uh, there is a man called Philemon. Uh, Philemon has a slave, Onesimus, who has run away. Now, this is a great uh, source of annoyance and grief and inconvenience to, to Philemon. And uh, Onesimus becomes a Christian. He's a friend of the Apostle Paul. 
And uh, Paul writes to Philemon, and he, he, he pleads with him. He says, I want you to accept Onesimus back. And I want you to accept him back, not just as a, a friend, but as a brother. In fact, Philemon, my challenge to you is this. I want you to accept Philemon, uh, uh, Onesimus, your runaway slave, in exactly the same way you would accept me if I came to your house. And so, to the runaway slave, Paul expects the acceptance that would be shown to the closest friend and brother. It's also used uh, in uh, Acts chapter 18 uh, about a young man called Apollos who was preaching uh, about Jesus Christ but didn't really understand uh, the Christian message in its depth. His doctrine was shaky. His theology wasn't really mature. So there's a couple in that church there, uh, Priscilla and Aquila. They see this young guy. They see his potential. They see his passion. They see his weaknesses. What do they do? They take him home and they sit him down and they explain the truths of, of the gospel to him uh, much more clearly. And uh, that idea of taking uh, Apollos home and sitting him down and talking things through with him, it's the same word, accept. It's the same thing. The other place where it's used in the New Testament is in John chapter 14. John chapter 14 is a, 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 a dark chapter for the disciples, really, because it's the it's the evening of the crucifixion and Jesus is explaining to them uh, what's about to occur, the, the havoc that's about to be unleashed. And it, he, he understands the, 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 the brutality of the events and how that will, will hit these disciples. And he, he has to reassure them about what's going to happen to them, to him and what's going to happen to them. And so in John chapter 14, at the beginning of John chapter 14, verse 3, he says, listen, you know, in my father's house, or in my father's mansion, it used to be, uh, there are many mansions, many rooms. In my father's house, there is plenty of space. In my father's house, there is a home for you. And it's the same word again. In my father's home in heaven, you don't need to worry because in my Father's home in heaven, there is a place, there is acceptance for you. So that's what the gospel does. The gospel just opens out this amazing acceptance of God to us and of us to others. Now, finding acceptance is really important. That's one thing we need to be really clear about, and sharing acceptance is really important. That's the second thing. Why is acceptance so important to us? Well, of course, because rejection hurts. Job applications get turned down. Uni places, you might not get the place you've applied for. Relationships don't work out. We feel rejected. We feel humiliated. We feel vulnerable. We question ourselves. We wonder what other people think of ourselves. We want to be, we long to be accepted, to be part of things to be at the heart of things. And uh, we often long for acceptance with God as well. And yet sometimes we think maybe God doesn't want me either. And we look at our lives, we look at the evidence, we see how our lives are going and they, it's not going the way we hoped. And we're saying, where's the evidence of God's love? And we feel rejected also uh, by God. Well, we were singing about uh, God and His love in Psalm 136, and there it says that God thought about us in our need. And it's an interesting idea, this idea of God thinking about me, Neil McMillan, here in St. Columbus on Sunday the 19th of August, and it's an interesting thing to think that, or to know, or to understand, or reflect on, that God is thinking about you at this very moment, whether you're thinking about Him or not. Um, and God thinks about us in an accepting, loving way. I heard a story in a sermon I was listening to this week uh, about Tim Keller's wife, Kathy. And uh, Kathy, Tim Keller's a, a minister in New York. He's very well known amongst uh, some people. Uh, he has a kind of very large church of thousands of people in Manhattan. And uh, 
his wife, when she was a little girl, so Tim's in his 60s now, uh, his wife is probably in her 60s, when she was a little girl, she used to write letters to C.S. Lewis because she just thought C.S. Lewis was the most incredible, amazing writer in the world. So she would, l- she lived in America, and she would, I think when she penned these letters, sent them to C.S. Lewis. And you know what? C.S. Lewis wrote her back. It's pretty nice for a, a 10 or 11-year-old girl. And she has got four letters still that she received from C.S. Lewis, and she reads them uh, from time to time. And the last letter she got from C.S. Lewis uh, was written 11 days before he died. And uh, he, he, he knew he was dying. He was very ill. He couldn't uh, type anymore. And, uh, yeah, 11 days before he ty- died, he took time uh, to write to this little girl and uh, he took her very seriously, her concerns and her thoughts and her ideas, and he wrote her this beautiful letter. And uh, she found it very moving to think that he, although he was sick and struggling and had very little time left in this world, he gave up some of that precious time uh, to write to a young girl he'd never met. What an amazing, thoughtful man. And it How amazing is it then that God thought about us and gave up his life, not just his time, gave up his life on the cross for us. And it costs Jesus, doesn't it, to accept us? He had to experience rejection and loneliness as well. He knew what it was to be single and celebrate celebrate with no place to lay his head. He understood feelings of being broken and lonely and misunderstood. He knew what it was to be falsely accused, to be unjustly condemned. Jesus suffered all of those things and much more because he knew that that was the only way that you and I could be accepted by the Father in heaven. Because our rebellion, our sin, our failure to love God, our failure to obey God, our failure to worship God as He deserves, all of that sin is a rupture. What can we do about that sin? Well, the Bible says nothing. And so, Jesus has done it for us. That's the great news of the Christian gospel, isn't it? You're trapped in sin. You're bound by sin. You're addicted to your sin. You cannot free yourself from your sin. But Christ comes, and in His suffering, in His pain, in His loneliness, in His rejection, He breaks you free from sin. He sets you free so that once again you can know the love of the Father in heaven. And so, if you're not a Christian, there's a question there, isn't there? If Jesus has done this so that you can be accepted by the Father in heaven, the question is, do you want what Jesus has done for you? Will you accept what Jesus has done for you? Will you accept Jesus himself? Or is Jesus going to face rejection here this evening as well from some of us as we close our hearts towards him. To be accepted by Jesus then is core to our identity as Christians. It shapes who we are. We are adopted by the Father in heaven. We belong to the family of God. We are children of the great King. The Lord, we know, loves us. The Lord keeps us safe. The Lord holds us in His right hand. The Lord is with us. And because we are secure in this way, because we know we are accepted in Jesus, then that security that we have in Christ frees us so that we're no longer afraid of people but rather we are free to love people. We no longer see other people as a threat, but rather we see other people as the ones that we are called to love and serve. And that's why our acceptance of others is rooted in God's acceptance of us. 
Because only once we are secure, only once we are resting in the fact that our identity is in Jesus Christ, will we then really to be, be free to love and accept others as we should. And so I want to think for a moment or two just about sharing the acceptance we've found. If God has accepted you, let you then accept others. Now, uh, don't know if you like London. Don't know if you went to London for the Olympics. Some of you might have been there. Uh, but apparently London was for two weeks the friendly city and all the Olympic uh, volunteers were just amazing. Uh, if you looked at a map standing in the middle of London, then somebody would come up and ask you, can we help you and where do you want to go? And so that's great, isn't it? Imagine being made to feel that welcome wandering about a great city that you don't know. And uh, we want our church to be like that. We want it to be a welcoming place where people's needs are noticed and where help is offered in a thoughtful, generous, and sensitive way to those who are moving back to the city, to those who are new to the city, to those who are outsiders. We want to say to them that we care and that we are concerned. And uh, that means, of course, that we do need to care and we do need to concern about, be concerned about those who are outsiders in one way or another. And that's a really important thing because sometimes I believe we aren't really bothered by outsiders or we can't be bothered with outsiders or we're indifferent to them. People come in, new people, and they go away every week. It happens all the time in this church, doesn't it? Hundreds and hundreds of people every year come through to this, into this church for the first time. And we get so used to it and so blasé about it and maybe perhaps indifferent. Well, indifference is a form of hatred. If you don't care about that person, you're saying they don't matter. They are of no significance to you. And so indifference to people is a betrayal of God and gospel. And so we cannot be indifferent to people who come into our church. We can't just say, I'm not bothered about them. We can't turn our backs on them and face inwardly into our cleats. Some of us probably don't want our church to change. Some of us probably don't want new people. Some of us don't want the church to grow. Some of us don't want our relationship to have different dynamics or our friendships to be interrupted in any way. Because we're here worshipping ourselves and our own comfort. And if that's our attitude to the outsider, we really need to hear God's rebuke, don't we? Because God says, how dare you? I bleed and die for you while you're my enemy. And you will turn your back on the stranger and the visitor and the outsider and the needy and the broken. So don't pretend you don't see people. And don't pretend you're not aware of who the visitor is. And don't pretend you haven't got time for them. Because God brings these people into this church. It's no accident. Anybody walked through the door of this, into this church, the Holy Spirit brought them. And so we have to be sensitive to them and welcoming, and loving, and compassionate. That means we need to create space for others. We have to adjust our own expectation and behavior. We need to look outwardly to see the stranger and the new person, to offer them a welcome and a smile. Sometimes it's just saying hello. Sometimes it's giving up your seat if the church is crowded and people are struggling to find somewhere to sit. Sometimes it's sharing your Bible if somebody can't follow what's going on. Sometimes it's explaining our quirks of worship. Sometimes 
It's inviting to a coffee down the stairs. Sometimes it's inviting to lunch. Sometimes it's inviting into your friendship circle. Sometimes it's inviting into your home. Sometimes it's sharing your resources. And we don't always feel like doing that for other people. But we are called to do it. And we need to treat each new person as someone wonderful, unique, that deserves our attention, that deserves our listening, and our thoughtfulness. You know, welcoming people is not a technique. You know, it's not just sort of an automatic sort of, yeah, 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 here's another new person, switch on the smile, give a quick handshake, and so on. Every person deserves to be taken seriously as another human being, made in the image of God, brought here by God, and into this community. It might be for an hour, it might be for a week, it might be for a year, it might be for many years. How do we know? So please, I'm really encouraging you to be practical about this. Look out for new people. If you need information about the service, the creche, the kids' church, the youth fellowship, or anything else, let them know what's going on. Explain things. If you see them again the next week, go back and say hello again. Don't just think, oh, I spoke to them last week. I don't need to speak to them this week. I'm off the hook. If people want to make St. C's their church, then help them to assimilate into the life of the church. Introduce them to other people. Introduce them to your city group. Introduce them to the church family. And don't leave it to others. That's the easiest thing in the world to do. Now, how can we do this? How can we really have a heart, not just a behavior, but a heart and a mind that is open to others. The specials are different from us. I was kind of annoyed. I was looking on Facebook for something tonight. Couldn't find it. It was a Facebook paste, uh, posting from uh, Smithton Free Church. And uh, they've created a new welcome page. I don't know if any of you have read it. A lot of people seem to like it. I couldn't find it this afternoon, but it's brilliant if you can track it down anywhere. And uh, I can't repeat it all because uh, I couldn't remember it all, and it's quite lengthy, but it is absolutely fantastic. And it just says something along the lines of, listen, are you homeless or have you got several homes? Are you divorced? Are you gay? Are you married? You're welcome in our church. Are you single? Are you young? You're welcome. Are you old and are you fun? You're welcome. Have you lost all your money at the bookies? You're welcome at Smithton. Have you lost your sense? You're welcome at Smithton. Have you lost your direction in life? You're welcome at Smithton. And it just goes through this amazingly long, comprehensive list, and it's very kind of articulately put, of all the messed up, screwed up, wasted, lost kind of people who might drift into the church. And it just wants to say to every single one of them, you're welcome. Now, what Smithton is doing in its welcome page is dangerous because unless that's more than words, you know, it's, it's going to backfire. But who, you know, are the broken people welcome here? The divorced, the lonely, the gay, the straight, the guy who's lost his money at the bookies the night before, the guy who's been out drinking all night, the couple who've broken up, the people who are lost and hurting, whoever they are, whatever their background, their ethnicity, their class, are they welcome? What I found uh, in the past is uh, every church says you're welcome to everyone. Of course they do. But there are subtle codes of behavior in churches. where some people are more welcome than others because we recognize who's like us and those who are like us get more easily accepted than those who are different from us and I've seen that at work in churches in very insidious ways it's never overt but it's working away in the fabric of a church if you're like us you're on the inside track if you're different, you're going to struggle. Nobody will be nasty to you. Nobody will say anything rude to you. 
but their hearts won't really be open and their homes won't really be open. So how are we going to welcome people with their differences? Well, the only way is if we have God's heart in us, isn't it? We have to remember we are loved by God despite the fact that we are so unlovely ourselves. We have to let the Holy Spirit pour His love into our lives day by day. We have to remember how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we are called children of God. The only way that you will love people as you should is if you love God as you should. And so you need to focus first on your relationship with God and let that be a relationship of mighty love. And if your relationship with God is one of great love, then that will overflow in your love into loving others, whoever they are. So let's accept what God offers. And what does God offer? Well, through the gospel, God offers us himself. And so let us receive him this evening. And then what do we offer to others? We offer ourselves. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we just ask that uh, this will be a church where we take uh, these kind of things really seriously, where we take people seriously, where we take your work and your kingdom seriously, where we take your gospel seriously and your word. And so we ask that... uh, We will know what it is to be accepted by you this evening. If anybody doesn't know that, we pray for them now at this moment. Lord, help them to accept Christ if they have never done so. Help them to see that Jesus is worth more than anything in life itself. And help them just to pray to you at this moment that you would be in their life also. And that they would be accepted by you. And we pray that we will love others too. And that we will accept others in this church, no matter who they are and how different they may be. In Christ's name, amen.